Good afternoon, almost good evening to everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, tricuspid truncated valve replacement. Uh, cardio valve keeps things in motion. We will see what that means. There is, uh, I already make a bit of spoiler in here. We, 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 uh, we know something happens with that. It is uh, a program which I managed together with Professor Vahenian, and we have Neil ah, here. Uh, Georg Nikenik, Anna Sanina, Tobias Schmidt as uh, presenters. We'll uh, discuss uh, uh, tricuspid replacement therapies. We will learn about the state of this, uh, uh, this, this uh, field. We will be updated on the cardioval tricuspid program. Mm -hmm. And we will also focus specifically on some imaging details, which I think are very interesting. So without uh, any further delay, I think we should start with Neil coming here to give us a lecture on the overall landscape of transcatheter valve, transcatheter caspid replacement therapies. Right. Thanks, Francesco. So, so here's a, a snapshot of the interventional landscape. We're going to be focusing mainly on uh, TTVR. It's okay, I will speak up. So this slide, slide has been updated to include uh, some new devices, but all of the valves you see here, at least the orthotopic uh, devices, are all now in clinical trials. And of course, we, we have randomized trial data finally for one valve, the Evoke, which we'll talk about a little bit, but don't worry. It's cardiovalve session. I'm going to show you cardiovalve case. Um, there is interest in, heter in heterotopic valves and spacers because not everyone can be clipped, not everyone can get uh, a valve in the tricuspid annulus, and so these more indirect treatments have generated some interest. So, I mean, one question that comes to mind is uh, one device, treat them all. Uh, we have this new classification for TR, uh, atrial ventricular functional, lead induced, and primary. So one thing we have learned from the studies of TR is that residual TR predicts clinical outcome and you know residual severe TR is associated with increased mortality and heart failure. The beauty of TTVR is that we abolish regurgitation in all patients. Uh, it has become a faster, more reproducible procedure. It's becoming more like TAVI. It's possible to do three cases in a day and still finish on time. It is re less reliant on procedural imaging than TIER, although this is uh, somewhat device specific. And it has the promise of being able to treat almost any pathology, whether that's big gaps, leads, carcinoid, rheumatic, et cetera. The cons we've seen from the early data are uh, signal for bleeding, uh, pacemakers, which is also device specific. Of course, you're putting tricuspid by a prosthesis. You have to worry about durability, but most of these valves are designed with valve and valve option, and then screen failure as well, although at least it's less than for mitral. So we're going to talk about the first randomized trial. It's relevant to all discussion of TTVR, the TRISEN2, which was evoke uh, and medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. And so this uh, first 150 patient data was looking at safety and efficacy up to six months, and uh, this was presented by Kodali at TCT recently, you can see low mortality at 30 days, uh, pacemakers though in 15%, and bleeding has come down from previously more than 20% to 10%, so there's a little bit of progress there. Uh, the important thing is that the quality of life as measured by KCCQ, uh, the delta is, is 18, you remember in Triluminate is 12. And in other analyses, that show mortality benefit, the delta is usually around 18 or 19 from the TAVI trial. So we'll see the one-year follow-up of the study if doing TTVR improves heart outcomes. So CardioValve uh, has now a second-generation delivery system which allows secondary flexion to get off the septum. And we had the uh, opportunity and the privilege to do this case a few months ago in Toronto. So this just shows you the initial position of delivery system with NPR with a septal to lateral trajectory and simply using secondary flex, you can then become uh, coaxial to the valve, 
which will then increase your chance of success. So this patient had a significant IVC offset angle, and uh, that's why this uh, new delivery system was very helpful. Uh, CardioValve is very simple, a valve to implant. You only have to capture two-thirds of the valve leaflets for the device to be stable and also to abolish TR because an atrial flange uh, is part of the fixation mechanism. So at the end of the procedure, there's no TR and the patient did very well. So what are the current challenges and unmet needs in this field? Uh, we still have issues with uh, screen failure. They have to make valves that are bigger. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, some patients have very shallow uh, RV or small RA. This can be a problem for the delivery system to fit. The offset angle we talked about, and then of course patients have very large flails, are tough to treat with valves that depend on leaf foot grasping. Uh, imaging is always a problem. You can't fix what you can't see. Patients who have RV dysfunction, you worry about futility. And then we've discussed bleeding, conduction, and, and durability. So that's the summary. I think the current devices can treat most but not all patients with TR. We need innovation, hard team approach. Uh, TTVR, I think, has the potential to become a frontline treatment for TR, but we need to make it safer. And finally, the results of the trials and the novel device development are eagerly anticipated, and I'll thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Uh, obviously, you bring a lot of experience in how many devices you are involved with. Uh, in replacement uh, at five. the moment? Five. Right. So you really have a big overview. I mean, one of the largest uh, possible. So I want to remind the audience, if you really want to uh, engage any, any discussion, you can uh, uh, interact via the app, or if you don't like apps like me, you can just raise your hand and come here and ask questions. Also, I'd like you to remind to rate the session uh, even if we are not so good, we are, we are nice people, so rate us high, yeah. otherwise we don't uh, get uh, rewarded, correct? Yeah. Alec, you know the story here. In yes, I know the story. So you have questions to the... Uh, uh, yes, I would like to ask you questions. Uh, can you comment a little bit about the preparation of the patient before tricuspid valve replacement? It's a question from Georg, in point of fact, but I, I ask... On his so, behalf. <laughs> so we, we routinely bring them in to the hospital two or three days before for IV diuretics. We try and get them to lose two or three kilos, and we found this will shrink tricuspid annulus by about two millimeters, just to ensure there's adequate oversizing and uh, no leaks. Okay, that's uh, good. Is it different from uh, a tier procedure, the, 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 the preparation, or you do the same for all tricuspid patients? Just. We don't routinely do that for tear. Maybe we should in some cases. Obviously, if, if a tear patient comes decompensated, we don't treat them. We wait and prepare them. But, you know, for tear patient, they usually come same day. We give them a single dose of IV diuretic. And uh, as long as there's no huge gap on the TE, we, we proceed. Okay. What, what about uh, Georg? I mean, you are one of the first who have been advocating the prehabilitation and optimization of patients. Yeah, I think it is, uh, as Neil pointed out, it is uh, in patients who do have uh, a large complication de defect, it is, it is wise to bring in the patient a couple of days earlier. And I would say that is true for a tier device and also for a replacement device. So I totally agree with Neil. Okay, so, so both tier and, 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 and TMV, yeah. uh, TTVR, you think uh, preconditioning is good? I mean, in, in the replacement, if you have a borderline anatomy, if, if you are able to oversize nicely, it may be not so important. But, but maybe you prepare the heart for the, uh, the after the mismatch. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a diff probably is a different uh, uh, target. Okay. So the patient is there, you treat the patient, and what happened after? Can you tell us a little bit? Do you change immediately the medical therapy? Do you wait for a while? Yeah, it's a good question. So Thank you. The, the usual time course is that you make them too dry. Uh, you, you, you put the valve in. Because you made them dry, they don't get after a mismatch. If by 48 hours they don't have RV dysfunction and hypoperfusion, then you can I think then start to reintroduce the medical therapy. Mm. It's rare that they need inotropes because they all have right heart cath prior to procedure to make sure you understand hemodynamics and then 
They're usually going home if everything is well, at least in our center, day three, day four. We're watching the rhythm as well. Georg, okay with that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm always okay with Neil. Um, uh, what I have to point out is, um, at least in our experience, I mean, it's a bit of eyeballing. It's not really scientifically valid. I have the impression that the patients who did yes, get, who do good. get a replacement, do a bit slower than the tear patients. The tear patient can uh, could actually go home. Um, I'm exaggerating. Could go home same day almost. Uh, but the replacement patients usually need one, two, three yeah. days to totally recover. Mm -hmm. They're a bit hypotensive, yeah. getting them out of the bed. They may have a bit of a renal issue. Um, the, that is at least my impression from the limited experience yeah. we have. If you can allow me a, a tricky comment, don't you think it's due to the patient condition more than the device? Uh, you, you think it's a negative selection because well, you probably take sicker patients, no? For our yeah, yeah, no? yes and no. Uh, yes and in, no. The studies, in the studies, in this, of course, you tend to you you tend to implant a valve in a patient which you cannot really treat with a tear device. But on the other hand, most of the patients are treated in the frame of a study, and there we have a lot of exclusion criteria. So I would say mm -hmm. the patient are not much sicker than no, the, the usual tear patient. I, I think I, it's what what Francesco said. You're eliminating TR. The RV function goes down, and then you have to get, you have to be very careful with their volume status. Okay. And the kidneys, because you diurese them, they're a little bit dry. It's just, you, you have to take your time. There's no rush to get them out. I just want to ask one quick question to Anna, because she, we have an imager on, on the stage with experience. And I want to ask you, uh, do you, when, when you check these patients, you, you receive a lot of echoes from, uh, from all these sites. Do you see the difference between uh, pre and post prehabilitation? So, how much is how much we gain with this uh, preparation? Well, uh, we don't always, you know, get pre and post rehabilitation. However, in some cases we do, uh, and I think it does have an important impact. Oh, yeah. We do see, you know, the reduced volume overload uh, in these ventricles. Uh, we do see also that the gaps sometimes, you know, go down, um, and so sometimes also, you know, effect on the um, stroke volume. There is an impact, definitely, okay. and that, that that is and that is important in uh, you know for for the sizing. Sometimes you know this this patient uh, in this size have actually to also repeat CT for sizing of the of the device itself. Okay, good. So we we establish is a good thing to prepare this patient. So Georg, I think we should uh, give the word to you to go a bit more specifically into the uh, topic of the night, which is cardio bulb. It just, uh, it's a new computer. It's relatively easy. Oh, okay, Random. okay. <laughs> but I have you on my side. So oh, no, you have him. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you very much for having me. These are my potential conflicts of, of interest. I hope you can hear me. I want to go uh, back a, a step. You have seen such an image before with Neil. We have multiple uh, possibilities to treat patients with tricuspid regurgitation percutaneously. Uh, with a device, and, and admittedly, of course, the tear devices are in the driver's seat. Most of the patients can be treated very safely and also with an accepta acceptable efficacy with a tear device. But we have some issues and some patients which we maybe cannot properly uh, treat with a tear device. The patients who do have multiple leaflets, clefts, calcification, stenosis, tethering, severe tethering, and lead-induced tricuspid regurgitation, patients with really large coaptation defects above 10 millimeters, for example, or who are very, which are very central. And of course, recurrency of TR may be an issue. We have to find out over the next years uh, with our clinical and, and study follow-up. And future treatment options are limited mm -hmm. if, if you use a tear device. We use it all a lot, and therefore we need additional, uh, additional alternatives for treatment of patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And therefore, it is a very good message that we have devices available to replace the valve. And one of these devices is the cardiovalve device. 
And it comes in, in, in the mitral and also in the tricuspid space, same valve, if you will. It comes transfemorally uh, via a transeptal approach on the mitral side, and of course you don't need this in the tricuspid space. It has a very low profile, and it's not very high. It's only 15 millimeters, so comparable to a surgical valve, and therefore uh, on the mitral side, LV or T obstruction may be not such an issue as with other devices. Then it doesn't rely on, on radial forces. This is very important for the tricuspid space because we have the AV knot in close vicinity and pacemaker rate is so far not a big issue, at least in the cardio valve studies we are running all together. Uh, but it's still a very firm anchoring by grasping the leaflets, by diving into the right ventricle and then developing the atrial flange. And then it has this, this inflatable cuff solution, as, as you can see here. I think there's also a... a a movie running and this fills with blood over time and it stuffs, if you will, this minor PVLs we sometimes see after the procedure and that makes it a, a very simple procedure uh, and tricuspid regurgitation in, in form of a PVL is really a rare finding after implantation of a cardiovalve device. And another very important advantage is it comes in, in various sizes and it has even an extra large size of 55 millimeters. And this is also very important in the tricuspid space. As you all know, most of the patients do have this large anatomies and need a, and, and are in need for a large or even an extra large a device. We have gathered some data. Neil was, was here extremely uh, instrumental from all the compassionate use patients treated with, uh, with the cardio valve so far. And you can, see, you can see the baseline criteria here. And most of the patients have been treated with the large or the extra large valve, as you can see on the left lower corner. And most of the patients on the right upper corner had massive or torrential TR before treatment. And the results are quite encouraging. On the left side, you can see reduction of, of tricuspid regurgitation. Almost all patients left the table and the hospital with mild or less tricuspid regurgitation. And on the right side, you can see the acceptable safety profile in a very early experience. Most of the, pa most of the patients, I, I was about to say most of the physicians, did the first tricuspid replacement with this device. And it is a novel device, as we all know. But this will be studied in, more, in a more systematic fashion within the target study. The target study is a prospective single arm study, if you will, an, an extensive early feasibility study. There will be 150 subjects enrolled in North America and, and Europe uh, in 45 investigational sites. And the patients to be enrolled are, of course, patients with symptomatic tricuspid regurgitation. And we plan a follow-up of five years. These are the sites who are enrolling already the patients or will enroll the patients in the very near future uh, around Europe and also, uh, for example, in, in Canada. And these are the inclusion criteria, and they are pretty straightforward. At least in my, ex in my experience, the, the screening failure is extremely acceptable with this device because, of course, we don't have to deal with LVOT obstruction. We just need the right size, and we need to have enough travel in the right atrium, in the right ventricle, and access. And you can see here, of course, we don't want to have patients with two large issues on the left side, so left ventricular ejection fraction below 30%. No precapillary hypertension is, of course, a, a, a contraindication because it doesn't make sense, pathophysiology. Severe right ventricular dysfunction is, of course, also a contraindication in these early studies. But we can treat, and as you can see, in the anatomical consideration apart patients with uh, 36 to up to 55 millimeters of diameter in the tricuspid annulus. This is the baseline criteria of the first 57 patients enrolled. And as you can appreciate, these are the usual suspects, uh, elderly patients, uh, predominantly uh, female, the majority in New York heart, three to four, uh, suffering from atrial fibrillation and the usual uh, comorbidities. And most of the patients so far, uh, two thirds of the patients uh, entered the study with massive or torrential TR. 
This is a, a, a very nice uh, video of a patient, of the first target patient enrolled with a one year uh, follow up. And as you can easily uh, depict here, there is no PVL whatsoever and there's also no gradient. Gradient is usually between one and two millimeters of mercury with this valve. So a beautiful result after one year in this patient. And so far we don't have a systematic long term follow up because we are still enrolling but it looks almost the same for all the patients we've been treating. Neil mentioned already the iteration. This is my last slide, the new iteration of the device. We have an inline sheath available, which makes the procedure percutaneously available, which is extremely important and, and uh, comfortable for, for the patient and also for the treating physician. And we have this enhancement in the steerability of, of, the, of the guide. This is very important. You, you can gain distance to the annular plane. You have a lot of flex possibility and you can also compensate for this, for this hugger by, by going lateral with the device. And this will ease up the procedure quite a bit. And we are busy enrolling the patients. Hopefully we'll present the data to you in, in a year from now. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Georg. So this is uh, the data which is available at the moment with this uh, device. And uh, Alec, you, have, you know, it's so difficult to be co-moderating with Alec. He has so many questions for you. That I, no, 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 do it, do it. I'm, no, I'm happy. No. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, uh, a, minute. wait, are, wait, a, wait a minute. We, are, we have a problem with the computer. Yes, we have a problem with the computer, so, but the gentleman is coming. No problem, really. Oh, it's so a if you have okay. questions, yeah. we cannot see the questions, so you yeah. need to stand up and ask questions. Okay, but uh, Georg, may, may I ask you? Maybe you recall one. Mm. You recall one question? Uh, no, 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 wait a minute. I have a tricky question for you. You are a real investigator in this field for long and you have experience. So what, is, what are the main criteria for exclusion of the patient in this trial? Can you explain? As, as uh, yeah. Uh, in the practice. Ma yeah, the main exclusion criteria for all trials and, and cardi the cardiovalve trial is, is not an exception, okay. is that the patient needs to, needs to have a decent life. So he needs to have a life expectancy of at least one year. And if you, if you, if you are stating this, you think about severe, severe right ventricular dysfunction. You think about frailty, if you have a severe, severe frailty issue in, in the scores below six, for example, we are reluctant to include this type of patient. If you have a patient with a severe left ventricular ejection fraction, impairment or biventricular disease, uh, we are also reluctant to include this type of patient in the study because we are not sure whether we will help this patient just by repairing one issue out of probably 10 issues this patient has with his heart. So just, you know, for, for this audience, not everybody is, uh, you know, having the hands on the device. And I would make a very simple question. How complex has been the learning curve? How easy or how difficult is to implant this valve? Did you find it uh, simple, conceptually simple? I mean, we are always a bit unfair because we compare it then with our first mitral clip in, in tricuspid yeah. cases, <laughs> uh, who took us like, I mean, we had edema and everything, not only the patient, but also we as physicians, because it took so long. So we learned more about the tricuspid space, but I, I think it's fair to say, Neil, it's way easier than, than doing a tear device. And I would say the learning curve, if you are experienced and familiar with the tricuspid space, is, is, is very steep. You need a couple of procedures to get familiar with the device, but usually the devices are so mature that you can use them right away. Yeah. And, and you don't need so demanding yeah. imaging, you need MPR imaging that you, yet you see the grasping of the leaflet. That's the yeah. same for the Evoke and the cardio valve. And that's I mean, about it. The, the case will take less than 30 minutes. Yes, and a good. tier, maybe Georg can do a tier in, in one hour, but uh, you know, it's very fast and reproducible and the result is the same at the end. You have no tier. So simple, easy, th that's very good. Uh, can you just say a word about anticoagulation? What's your regimen you give in general for this valve in general? And in, in, in general, I mean, 
almost 100% suffering from atrial fibrillation, so oral anticoagulation is mandatory. And uh, usually we, had, we were struggling. We were putting patients on vitamin K antagonists because we weren't, un, we weren't sure. But right now the, the, we are going back to NOACs. Most of the patients are coming to the hospital with the NOAC and they continue to be on the NOAC. We, we pause them for one or two days in order not to risk an excess bleeding issue, but then they go back on their, on their regular anticoagulation. Yeah. Yeah, so same thing. I mean, we, we learned the hard way. Avoid warfarin and uh, no antiplatelets needed. Okay. So other? I think we should uh, move yes, because we, we, are, uh, we, we need to see some, uh, some data, some imaging data. And don't forget the RV is in the middle of the problem. Huh? So Let's please, see. Anna. <laughs> I think we, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. Um, and we talk a little bit about the landscape of transcatheter uh, tricuspid valve replacement. We talk a little bit about cardio valve. Now let's dive in uh, into imaging. These are my conflicts. Uh, I think we have come a long way in the journey of uh, tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation. We know now about you know, all the uh, new anatomy, new etiology, uh, new morphology, and we do um, uh, classify, of course, severity uh, with five grades. All this uh, is relevant because all this matters in the way we approach the, uh, the valve and in the way we decide what type of intervention we're going to do for each specific patient. But of course, it's not only about the uh, tricuspid valve and the anatomy, the severity. We need to look at the RV. Uh, RV matters, and it matters when we look at the baseline RV function. We know from multiple studies, no matter how we measure and we assess RV function, Function with TAPSI, uh, RVPA coupling, with uh, 3D, with strain, having RV dysfunction as an impact on the survival of patient with TR. Uh, the question that is still uh, very uh, relevant is actually how the RV uh, reacts and responds to tricuspid valve intervention. So what happens to the RV function after we solve the TR? Um, and this is a meta-analysis that we did um, a couple of years back, and what we found, and this is data from uh, multiple studies, different devices um, all together, so we do see that fractional area change actually goes down, TAPSI goes down, this, uh, this actually means that the RV function in a way goes down, uh, but if you look at the uh, tricuspid valvular annular diameter also reduces, so this is a, um, you know, a marker of um, RV remodeling, uh, but very uh, interestingly and very importantly, even though the RV function appears to be uh, reduced, after removing the TR or reducing TR, we have an increase in forward stroke volume. And so this is very, really something to keep in mind that is telling us that the TR has gone away and the RV probably is not as bad as we thought. So let's, uh, let's translate and let's bring this into the context actually of cardiovalve. Uh, what we see, uh, and uh, what's already been mentioned, this is uh, very preliminary data from the target study, uh, is that actually the uh, TR goes away, and in fact, in all the patients that have been treated so far, you can see that in 100% of them, TR is gone. They have um, a mild or less TR, uh, and you can see this was an example from a, um, from a very um, nice case that was performed uh, recently. Uh, let's look at the RV then. RV function also, also here appears to go um, you know, down. We have a reduction in S prime and TAPSI, however, it's not dramatic. And very interestingly, as uh, I showed before from data from that meta analysis, also with uh, the Carnival device, we have an improvement in LV, um, LVT stroke volume. Um, and if we look at strain, RV strain, also here we can appreciate some reduction from baseline to six months in the RV strain, but um, I would like to point your attention to actually to the basal uh, portion of the RV, um, and maybe we can see that very, uh, very nicely in this slide, if it plays. There we go. So this was this uh, case at uh, baseline, and you can see uh, the um, echo for chamber at six months. Uh, look at the base. The base of the, of the RV is still moving. It's not frozen, which uh, you know, is something that we fear uh, when we do tricuspid valve replacement. We do have a, a preserved annular motion, uh, which is a very interesting feature of the cardiovascular device. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the device actually moves together uh, with the annulus, and we uh, expect this to have uh, some sort of impact in the, in the follow-up that we'll see in this patient. Of course, still very preliminary data. Um, if we look then at RV remodeling, this is some data uh, from, uh, from CT. This was a, um, a case at three months. We have a, a favorable reduction in RV, uh, in RV volume, and this was uh, done you know, by, uh, by CT, as mentioned. Uh, here are some images before and after. Again, reverse, rever reverse remodeling of the RV uh, in a second case. Uh, images pre and post, um, again with CT. You can see how the RV shrinked down. Uh, after uh, the um, uh, resolution of TR uh, with cardiovalve. We do also see a reduction in uh, IVC diameter, uh, reduction in the annulus. 
uh, again, RV diameter, R, um, RA uh, volume, and RV and diastolic volume. And these are all the data that I just showed you. Of course, these also translate in a reduction of uh, RVEF, which is mainly um, uh, due, of course, to the fact that we are reducing uh, the, the volume themselves. Uh, same data here, reduction, significant reduction in RV and diastolic volume, some reduction also in uh, the RV and systolic volume. And so to conclude, of course, you know, tricuspid regurgitation uh, is a bad problem. It's associated with impaired survival. We do have now multiple transcatheter options, uh, but preliminary data with transcatheter um, replacement devices suggesting improvement in forward stroke volume despite an early reduction in RV function. Uh, of course, the assessment of RV function, its relation to uh, reductions versus abolition of TR, as well as its role on long-term clinical outcomes needs um, uh, still more data and awaits completion of um, large randomized clinical trials. The preliminary data with Carnival device show complete elimination of TR with limited impact on the right ventricle, importantly preserving, preserving annular motion. How this, of course, will translate into clinical outcomes remains to be investigated. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. As usual, when we look at this uh, data, there is always a little bit of, uh, a lot of data, a lot of uh, <laughs> concepts here. But I, let me filter it and, 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 and digest it. Uh, let me ask you a question. We understand, we said before, a patient undergoing transcatheter replacement has a pathway which is a bit longer to recover after this procedure as compared to patients with uh, uh, TTVR, uh, with uh, yeah. TR. Yeah. Many reasons, probably TR ha does not eliminate TR completely. Maybe TR is not touching the annulus. Maybe, 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 maybe. Uh, do you think we will see in the future valves which are preserving LV fu RV function better than others? And do you think the uh, how important is to have a small valve rather than a large valve which is pushing to be fixed on the annulus? I think that's absolutely the point. We see that, um, you know, with cardiovascular in particular, we see that really the base of the RV is not paralyzed. It's still moving. It moves together with the device. Uh, and that has to mean something, because when that base of the RV is gone, of course, that contributes to so much of the RV function uh, that it's really hard to imagine that there will be a recovery in that area when the valves are completely pushing and paralyzing that, that part of the RV. So it, it has to mean something. Of let course, me, we need more data. Yeah, let me tell you count. something from my surgical perspective. There are no surgeons around, so I need to be the surgeon now. <laughs> um, one thing I've learned in my career, whenever you replace a valve in a dysfunctioning ventricle, either right or left, but even in a functioning ventricle, smaller the better. If you implant a too large valve, what you do, you fix the base of the heart in a larger diastolic uh, uh, configuration. So I've seen, and I'm fortunate I'm not a scientist, so I didn't collect data, I don't have data, I don't know, but I have, I, I have memory. I've seen that if you use a too large valve, surgically implanted, which means you fix the base of the heart to a very large diameter, often you have uh, systolic dysfunction, and after the mismatch is more evident in this patient. So that, that convinced me, uh, when we have been initially de designing this valve, the idea was avoid any radial force for fixation if possible, which is Obviously, a challenge at the end of the day because you know it's easier to fix a valve with radial force. Absolutely, it goes along with a relatively low rate of pacemaker as far as we can judge today, mm -hmm. because that's a, that's an issue. Huh? That's a, what do you think about how do you treat the patient who need a pacemaker after the procedure? A uh, very good question. Um, in in <laughs> In most of the time, we do coronary sinus um, um, leads um, uh, in order to uh, in order to avoid to go through this f through this freshly impaired valve. But you could also do a micra, and, and, and at the end of the day, you could also place a lead if if uh, everything else is not successful. But uh, pre our predominant approach is to a CS a CS uh, lead. Yeah, we, we have same approach. Okay, a question for you. Oh yeah, uh, when do you think? we should assess the RV function changes after the procedure. 
I think right now what we're doing is looking at you know the discharge. So you know within five days, seven days to the after the procedure, we look at them one month after, six months after, and I think that at six months we are starting to see. Uh, some sort of recovery of, of, of RV function. So, you know, within 30 days, it's still going down, uh, but uh, within the first six months to one year, uh, we should see some improvement. Okay, but uh, you can reassure us there is no real catastrophe immediately <laughs> due to the RV. We haven't seen that so far. Again, that can be also uh, a selection uh, thing because, of course, we are really excluding patients that have very bad RV function to start with. Any In those patients who have a bad uh, yeah. post-preparative outcome usually is not really only just uh, RV dysfunction or what, what we know as an after mismatch. Often we have uh, multi-organ failure and I think uh, very important that you should never do this procedure as an emergency. Uh, yeah. The first ever tricuspid cardiovascular was an emergency and it was perfect result but the patient eventually didn't recover out of this uh, multi-organ failure. She came with multi-organ failure and that, that was unfortunately a, a bad outcome. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree. Um, never do that and always prepare the patient well. But I, I think a readout for, for afterload mismatch is also um, liver and renal impairment. So it's also the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have this low output, so a, bit of, a bit of low output, these patients run into additional renal issues. I mean, they're all renal failure patients, sure. more or less. And, and then this cascade starts to evolve, and then they're getting inflammation and all kinds of stuff. So, Alec, uh, yeah. uh, this, yeah. this, de this device is simple to be used. Yes, I could use it even, even me. But I have a question, uh, my dear Georg, my dear Neil. Uh, it could be very helpful to use a tree score. Do you agree with that? To predict the the outcome in the patient. Do but, you agree? But this, this score is validated in surgical patients. I mean, it still applies to our patients. Yeah. Everything that Francesco said is true. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they get afterload mismatch. You give them some time, uh, milrinone, and uh, the RV recovers. As long as you selected the patient well, mm -hmm. I've never had a patient die from RV afterload mismatch. If the patient was selected, they had right heart cath, you, you excluded pre capillary problem, yeah. they recovered. And if we, if we are still believers in the role of RV function, what is the best way to assess the RV function? It's an easy question. You have 15 minutes to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Back here. Uh, yes, well, that will be my first answer. The second will be always try to integrate multiple parameters. Don't only look at TAPSI or um, 3D RV function. Look at multiple things. Integrate longitudinal circumferential function, and maybe you will get it right. Thank you. Alec, I think uh, now we have a demonstration that this is a simple procedure because we have a very special one <laughs> yeah. where somebody has done twice. Okay, Tobias Schmidt is uh, presenting us a very special case, correct? Twin, um, twins. To is be it, honest, is I, birth? Try, I try to present you two cases. Yeah. And um, I, if I remember correct, uh, you were with us in the first uh, procedure for yeah. the mitral. And uh, we called it the twin cases. Um, uh, I show you a life in a box case for uh, transconceder mitral and tricuspid valve replacement. And I, these are my disclosures. And uh, we have talked about point number one that the, the transconceder valve uh, replacement therapy is a possible uh, treatment option, high risk patient. And in this case, we would like to show you the procedural outcomes for. TMVR and TTVR, for, so for the mitra and tricuspid with the cardiovascular system in a single patient. So this is the patient history. It's a 78-year-old patient, new heart class three, high um, risk scores. And this patient had a severe mitral regurgitation when we met him the first time. And the TR was moderate by that time. And this patient was, um, had a bypass surgery in 1998. And uh, he had a chronic renal disease, which was not severe, but um, stage three and diabetes. And the heart team was uh, discussed that there should be a, a screening for the uh, transcutaneous mitral valve repair due to a short posterior leaflet. I will show you in a second. And then we included this patient in the AHEAD trial, um, which is the trial for the mitral um, side of this procedure. 
And this is just a short overview of um, what was in the beginning. And you might see now on this uh, right picture that the posterior leaflet is really, really short. And you see the eccentric jet going over this, uh, over this posterior leaflet. So we were really happy that we didn't have to treat this patient with a tear. Um, in mitral position, because this was five to six millimeters, which we all know this is not a good candidate. And we were happy that um, this patient met the inclusion criteria for the AHEAD trial. And um, then you, um, I just show you real quick the deployment of the valve, as mentioned before, the anchoring of the um, grasping legs and then opening the atrial flange, which comes from the um, left atrial side, and then the um, disengagement of the catheter. And on the right side, you see the acute results. So we are really happy with this patient being treated, and you don't see any... Um, residual MR, but uh, I show you some more pictures in a, in a few uh, minutes. So this patient resolved from dyspnea, but peripheral edema was still present, and um, this patient also due to the study came to us um, every half a year. And after one, one and a half years, the patient had a progression on his um, TR. Uh, mitral valve was still good, and um, we included this patient in a target trial, so the, um, the tricuspid side um, treating with a and we used the um, L procedures. And now I try to show you, this is a life in a box case, so you see August 21 and March 23, uh, which we did. On the left side, you see the mitral, and on the right side, you see the tricuspid. And what we wanted to show you is um, that the steps of the procedure are um, almost the same. So you see again the short mitral valve leaflet, and you see on the right side the severe TR. I think this is, this is clear that... Um, this is a good candidate for treatment of the valve disease. And the first step is always to insert the system. So for mitral, you always have to go transeptal, transfemoral, transeptal, as Professor Nikonik um, mentioned, and you have to do a, a predilation of the atrial septum, and then you have to advance the system. And then you start, uh, if you're in a good position, you start to opening the grasping legs. On the right side, you, you see the, the second valve also uh, on top, like this is the mitral procedures. And after you've opened the grasping legs, you're still in the atrium, right or left. And then you have to cross a native valve by advancing the catheter through the valve. And you see it pretty good on the left side for the mitral. And you see some bubbles coming. And you see the pullback right away after this. And um, you see the small posterior leaflet. And um, this got attached to the anchors quite good on uh, tricuspid. You do the NPR, as mentioned before, to, um, to, to check if all the anchors are engaged. And um, if you're satisfied, um, then you can open the atrial flange, which you can see here. So we were satisfied in both cases. And then you, you, um, you turn the knob and the atrial flange is opening. You saw it on mitral, and now you see it on the, on the right side for the tricuspid. You see the steps are almost the same for both sides. Um, that's also displaying the learning curve that was mentioned before. And after you have um, opened the atrial flange, you have to um, deploy the whole procedures. And you, uh, as you can see, you're still stuck a little bit to the end of the procedures. After this is uh, deployed. You have to remove the whole system. On the left side, you see mitral. We kept the wire still in the ventricle, which we don't do anymore for tricuspid right now. Most of the time, you can pull back the wire and remove the system. So after you have done this for both sides, we did this with a 1.5 years difference, um, you have to check the final results of the valves. And what you can see on the left side is the result of the mitral, as I mentioned before, where a mean gradient of 4.5, a trace MR, which is um, paravalvular, para not uh, in the valvula. And on the right side, the um, tricuspid, which has only a mild PVL, and um, which is really important, I think, is to check um, also the gradient on the tricuspid side. We also did an angio because um, um, for the mitral because it was a severe MR, and now you don't see any MR in the angio of the left ventricle. And again, on the right side, we measured the gradient. We also showed you this 
um, which I think is really, really important um, to focus on that. So this is how it looks um, at the end. That's why we called it the Cardio Twins. And uh, we were really happy to do this. And uh, not to forget, we have also um, in this patient um, kind of follow-up, the MR after two years still looks the same. So we are really happy. And the TR um, after six months um, looks still fine. So we are we're really happy with this result in this one single patient. Thank you. Just a word, because we have a problem, an issue with this machine, this computer, always switch off, so please, raise, go to the mic and ask your question, it will be great. So, any question to our friend, Tobias? Uh, so, you, you are living in a rich country. I have a question, please. You, um, uh, you have a question? There's Sorry, a question. please, yeah. go ahead. No, maybe you said it, but, but, but what French sizes are we talking about, and do you close the atrial septum afterwards? Yeah, I think this is a really good question because you probably um, are looking for the progression of the TR, right? Um, so the French size is 37 French, and we need a surgical cut down um, for the procedures. Um, right now, there's a, a next generation which you can do percutaneously. We did one case which went well for the groin, really nice uh, result on that. So. Um, there's an improvement for percutaneous treatment, but in these cases, we did a surgical cut down in this patient, and due to the capsule that is inserted, which has a gap, um, it is really necessary to do that, and we also use the vascular surgeon to have the best um, position for the first procedures because we're still in a learning curve and we don't want to get into any trouble of anything. Um, we didn't close the atrial septum. That was the second question. We didn't close it. Um, actually, due to the fact we discussed before that the patient took a little longer to, to, to go back to the ward, we did a right heart uh, cast afterwards because we weren't sure if something was going on and uh, the QPQS was uh, one to one, so there's, there was not a uh, significant shunt. And Philip Lutz also um, showed this for the uh, mitral tear uh, procedures that you should, it's not necessary to close the shunt. Thank you. The very last question, please. <laughs> yes, may I ask a question about the sizing? We know the tricuspid annulus dilation is definitely not around. It may be caused by the left heart disease or caused by the atrial fibrillation. It can dilate more lateral or more only to the posterior. So I want to ask about the technical difference with the two type of the dilation. Is it the ending sizing difference or technical difference? Or the, uh, and what is the minimal leaflet length is required for the device insertion? Thank you so much. Very good question. A short answer. If, uh, you want yep. to answer? There is no difference in, uh, in so it, as usual, these devices are round shape that they will adapt to different uh, shapes. Uh, the length of the leaflets is uh, analyzed on, uh, on CT scan, but usually this is not the issue. I mean, you, you don't have short leaflets in the, in the tricuspid annulus. I mean, you always can grasp leaflets. Obviously, there are some limit. The main limitations of these therapies are uh, obviously annual size. A huge annual size is not yet available. But uh, also the other problem is the, the size and the, the, the high, the, the distance between the annulus and the free wall of the right ventricle. This is probably one of the main uh, components for this, te this therapy at the moment. Okay, Dr. Dr. Schmidt will be yours after the session, so uh, sure. you can discuss. Now, it, because we are running out of time. So now it's my pleasure to call our chairman, uh, Professor Maizano, who will tell us about his rosy prophecy, the future of tricuspid valve repair and replacement. Uh, just, just in line to, to the final question, which is, makes a lot of sense, uh, we have uh, understood that there is no one uh, phenotype of tricuspid regurgitation. And so there are different phenotypes, different patient pre presentation, different patient pathways. Imagine those patients coming after the open heart surgery uh, from the left side, a kind of patient. There are some patients who are coming after uh, lung reduction, different type of patient. There are patients who are in the AFI, who are in the EP lab. There are patients who are maybe just home with uh, chronic AFib and elderly and FPEF. So many different uh, uh, phenotypes. And this probably will one day uh, drive the decision to have different treatments to adapt to the different phenotypes. 
We know that the TR prognosis uh, changes according to the etiologies. Uh, we know that um, most of these patients have secondary TR. There are very few patients with primary TR. And there are multiple layers guiding decisions. I wanted to make it short, this, uh, this prophecy. Well, prophecy are always a bit blah, blah, blah. It's rosy, this one. Yeah? It's rosy, prophecy. Rosy, rosy. I don't know what is rosy, but uh, <laughs> prophecy. So prediction of the future is always challenging, but I think that we need to have a multi-layer uh, decision-making process, which is including multiple concepts, multiple uh, variables. Obviously, anatomy. Let's make it simple. We know that there are some patients who may respond very well to tear. These patients today are primarily sent to tear. Patients with really three leaflets, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the jet that comes from the anterosetal commissure, most of these patients may be treated. But we know that if he's, this is not the case, we have a bad, bad outcome. But the anatomy is also a key factor for eligibility for TTVR in many patients because of what we have said, annular size, size and shape of the right ventricle, position of the papillary muscle, in some cases probably the position of the, the, the location of the inferior vena cava and the angles, you know, if you have uh, early stage devices. So many, many co uh, anatomical constraints. Then there is the issue of RV function. We still don't know what is the limit. In the trials, we only accept patients with very good RV function. We don't accept patients with bad RV function. And I think we're learning how to use right heart catheterization more and more in, in our practice. Finally, and probably not, not the last, uh, patients are not valves, are not ventricles. Patients are patients. And these patients are more patients than other patients. We learned that the tricuspid uh, disease is truly a disease of the holistic approach to patients. These patients are multimorbid. They come in different stages with an increasing uh, load on uh, physiology and, and organ function. So putting all together in the future, we will have to take decisions. And this is my rosy prophecy. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously open, open to discussion. So CAVI, Caval implant, my practice at least, and I think also in the future probably more and more, will have a role in those patients who have anatomical contraindications for anything else. And this is already what we do today. So mainly this will become the solution for end-stage patients in a palli palliative approach, although there is an ongoing uh, effort to find a role for CAVI also in the earlier stages. Let's see, this is all obviously open to discussion. TT, transcatheter valve repair works well before there is a huge deformation of the, of, the, of the anatomy. So early stage, I truly believe that repair plays a role and I think that will be some backslash, you know, some, some annual plasty will come back because we like the idea to treat patients earlier and to leave door open to many other th therapies. And in between we have TTVR which is beautiful for many reasons, obviously. You know, why it is beautiful? Well, because uh, TTVR in the management of TR, first of all, look at this slide, I'm became, I did myself. I'm very right. proud of this slide, look right. at this slide. <laughs> oh, it's much better, what is it? Uh, so, first of all, why do we like TTVR? Uh, TTVR means uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Just because R, um, if you have a, 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 you know, can be repaired. It's a replacement. Okay, what we like about TTVR? It's easier to be, to easier than uh, than repair. We we agree. Okay, we have agree. been we saying agree. that. We agree. Four out of four. Should I press the button? Uh, yeah, please, please. Okay, Whoa. ease of use, ah, okay. done. The eligibility is going to be an important factor. If uh, the device is uh, accepting many patients, then the eligibility is large, and then this device will have a role, will play a role in, 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 the, uh, in this setting. If the eligibility is difficult, it's going to be a problem. Well, we have the problem of pa permanent pacemaker. Uh, we have seen... Uh, the risk is between uh, 5, 15 percent. Still, the numbers are low. 
But risk of pacemaker is one of the issues because it's not an easy issue to be solved. The question was how to deal with these patients, we don't know. Uh, coronary sinus, micra, go through many, many questions still available and problematic. Another problem is durability, obviously. Durability uh, will play a role, but we will know durability only in 10 years' time, so who cares about this? Well, you know, <laughs> there is, this is a reality. No, we care, but honestly, the durability is really one of those endpoints which I have to be tested against time. And central preservation of function. I think that is a central point uh, in, uh, in the future of TTVR, because I truly believe that we can deal with uh, a degenerated uh, TTVR. We can deal, I think we can do valve in valve. We can deal with a pacemaker. We can deal with something a little bit more difficult, but we cannot deal with some device which is uh, damaging the RV function. So, in my humble opinion, preservation of RV function is key element for the future of TVVR, and this is my Rossi prophecy. Thank you so much. Okay, so thanks. We did not plan at this stage questions. If you have one burning question to a Rossi prophecist, no. So, ah, yes, there is one, please. Well, just stop me. Uh, when do you get the pacemaker issue? Because you can't put in a wire Im uh, uh, yeah, immediately. So do you put a pacing wire in the left ventricle in these cases or what? Yeah, you can do several things. In the left ventricle, you mean? Yeah, it can, can be done as well, sure. But, uh, I think the easiest approach is to put a coronary science wire. No, that was not the, 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 No. If you get like a TAV, you get a complete AV block during the procedure, then you can put in a temporary pace wire. But here you can't put it in. You can't make a, I, I don't, you can make a sinus. Uh, you just pace on the safari wire that using yeah, the implant yeah. the valve. If okay. you, you're talking, if you have a, a, a AV block during the procedure, the easiest uh, way is to go to safari directly. We have been initially using a pace mega lead, but we don't do it anymore. And these people do not need very sophisticated pacing because 95% are in AFib. Huh? <laughs> you agree, so the atrium. So, I think, Francesco, you, you did a very good job. I mean, you, but this guy. Unfortunately, the computer didn't work well, but we had good questions until the end, and we are pretty reassured that transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement is there. It works. It works well. Of course, we have to wait for durability. Of course, we have to solve several issues. But Francesco told us now we enter in the era of personalized medicine. That's very important. And we have to work all together. And as uh, Jésus-Christ and Jean-Marco used to say, patients are very lucky because one plus one equals three. It means for the patients, we have repair, replacement. That's great. So that's our goal, my friend. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much.